after that. Had he not won the world title that year, would you say Curran would still have that same influence? I don't know. So yeah. that, I mean, I guess he, he did win the title in that heat. I suppose I was going to say is it was mem- remembered more for being a great heat uh, rather than whereas the title was almost a second, a, a, a different thing, because he would have won the world title had he won that heat or not, if he won, you know. Well, the big question is, Jim, yeah. maybe it wasn't the heat that had the most impact, but Matt Warshaw's article of Curran winning the world title in Surfer that had that effect. <laughs> uh, I hate to break to you. Matt Washer didn't write an article about No, that. not Matt. I mean, uh, Matt uh, George. Matt George. Sorry. Ugh, got him mixed up. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. Anyway, let's get on with all uh, these 13 all right, moments all right. right here. Okay, so let's go with number one. Year 2000, Laird Hamilton's Millennium Wave. You. Yeah, that that was, you go. That was you a go. pretty awesome wave. Um, uh, but yeah, like, was it like a massive impact? I mean, it, it was it was unbelievable. And I remember seeing that picture. It was just like, what the fuck? And also, uh, what what Matt Washer writes in the in the joint is that you know it was quickly superseded by. Uh, Shane, oh, Dorian, Shane Vitae Dorian, Vitae David, Vitae David, then Shane Dorian, then yes. uh, Mano Drolet, and everyone who's come after. Yes. Uh, Malik Joyo, like all of them have had like those kind of crazy millennium type waves. Yeah. And um, I mean, but one thing about that wave is it's still the most beautiful of them all. Like that, that you've never seen as perfectly glassy a wave at Chopu with those colors. And it's funny, like Laird Hamilton, quite often, a lot of the stuff he's done has always been like really high quality, beautiful stuff, you know, yeah. even like his hair is beautiful. Like uh, that, <laughs> that's what it should be remembered for, the most beautiful big wave that's ever been written. <laughs> well, I, I think it... it um... That wave blew people's perception of what could be written. Mm. And I would say um, not long after that, like Ship Stern's Bluff became known. And then people started seeking out slabs because they started mm. realizing towing in didn't have to just be for big waves, but could be for slabby waves. Good point, um, yeah. You know, up until that point, there hadn't really been a lot of towing at Chopu that I'm aware of. Um, you know, so that wave just opened the door to a whole new genre of surfing and, and so many new careers out of that, too. Um, but then it also proved it was possible to survive that. Uh, and then it, it, was a, it was a foundational moment, I would say. I would say that wave and Corey Lopez's wave at Chopes, mm. those two are probably brick, I don't want to say brick one and two, but that's like the concrete slab at the base right now. That is like, that set the foundation for it. Maybe Joel Fitz at Chopu back in like 95, I think, or 94 um, had been, and a few other people had surfed it. And, and the Gotcha break. Pro also. Of course. But, well, that was, that was 97. And that was originally the Black Pearl. And then 98 was the big year when Gotcha came on board. And that's when it, it blew the doors off and, you know, Conan Hayes lost to Kobe Aberton and then complained about it, saying he put his life on the line. But he's, his wave, he felt, should have gotten an 11 instead of a 10. Mm. So, <laughs> um, Nig- Nigel Tufnell wave. Yeah, well, I would say this belongs on there. It definitely oh. does. You? All right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. You in agreement yeah. here? Yeah. All right. All right. Number, Number two. two. 2005, Clark, Clark Foam, Foam Closes. closes. Well, I would say it's probably one of the most important, uh, you know, things that have happened. Uh, curious your thoughts on it. Well, you, were, you were out of the country at this time, right? You weren't living here when that happened, 2005. Right. Yeah, no, I was, I was here in London at the time. Um, yeah, now, like you, you were saying that this was crucial in changing the whole surfboard building industry. Um, because it opened the door to incredible new board tech yeah. and also mass-produced boards overseas. 
But it's interesting. What do you think? Because Matt wrote that actually that was the prediction, but it didn't actually open the door to that. And what happened instead was that everybody realized that they liked PU surfboards. I have to disagree with Matt on it. You know, I think people, yes, initially for the first five, six years after, yeah, no doubt. But it, what ended up happening is it, it took the monopoly away, the control that Gar- Gordon Clark had. Like Grubby, you, I've heard stories where he like would shut down competitors. You know, he would, he would do things to, to make sure no one could compete. He was pretty ruthless in that way. And then if you, God help you, if you were a shaper and pissed him off, like you could be cut off of your supply. And while he ran it really nice, clean company, and it was, I mean, as clean as can be, I guess, dealing with petrochemicals. But um, to me, it seems like, uh, it did have a, a longer effect because there's no monopoly controlling the blanks. It really did open up a lot of companies to experiment with different things. And there was a, I don't know if you remember, but there were people trying things with sugar blanks. They were trying with all these different types of, you know, uh, you know, formula formulations and EPS. But then also I think it, it did help with the expedition of, of export exporting surfboards overseas being made overseas. I do think that had something to do with it, but look what came out in the wake of it. Look at surfboard design now, Jabe. I mean, it's fuck, man. You got lost. How many different techs does Matt Biolis use in his boards? He uses lib tech, he uses lightweight speed. He does all these different things There's no, one thing anymore and i would say that that clark foam closing is really important yeah i mean there are i mean now 15 years on there are a wide variety of texts this was someone in new zealand making um foam out of mushrooms i think yes Um, yes mushrooms is awesome by the way in terms of packing and a foam replacement yeah it's kind of mind-blowing i don't know if you ever followed or, or seen how they like harvest mushrooms and then like make they're making into foam packaging and stuff instead of using foam and then it breaks down it's fucking awesome (laughs) yeah so definitely yeah mushrooms definitely have some magic yeah (laughs) all right so uh okay yeah no i have to agree that was that was a big deal i mean what was what it also uh gave proliferation was to was some actually some interesting surf articles afterwards yeah, because people actually really wrote about like a real issue rather than just contests and stuff. And there was, yeah, you know, Dave Parmenter wrote some really interesting stuff about how it was going to be really difficult for the surf industry, and you know, he played devil's advocate to it being a, a good thing. Um, it it was it was a fascinating time when it closed. Yeah, and I think Gordon went on to great success as a cattle rancher. Like, I think he ended up what? being like one of the best cattle ranchers in the West. Look at I was going to ask like how he, you know, what, what did he do after? I've, I've not followed. Up. I think he did really. I mean, he was, he was, it was a, a very, I, I would love to read a real deep profile on him because everything I've read about him, when we were talking earlier tonight about interesting characters, I think he was a very interesting character actually. And uh, a very he clever was- guy. There hasn't been a whole lot. I mean, I know he's very private and he, he definitely is someone who, who do, has not really talked much to surf media or any media, right? But in, in Surfers Journal, there's a lot of articles where people talk about him. Um, yeah. So you, you could glean stuff from that and, and uh, make a pretty good thing. Well, maybe we should look on the EOS and see what they maybe, say. Maybe <laughs> we need to piecemeal EOS articles together for each other. You know, I got to tell, I got to tell, I got to talk about this quickly, Jamie. Um, so for our listeners, Jamie, what he had did for me for a gift for my birthday and is the greatest gift, I think, or Christmas, I believe. It's like the greatest gift I've ever gotten. I gave him he, a bag of mushrooms. Well, he gave me a bag of mushrooms and, and a Joey bag of donuts. And uh, no, he, he basically took photos. He went through his whole surf magazine collection and took photos of everything Tom Curran and Wayne Lynch. And then he put it all together into an anthology book. And it's got ads, photos, articles, like everything you can want. And you can see the evolution of these 
no pun intended there, Wayne Lynch. Um, evolution, anyone? Is this thing on? Hello? Never mind. Um, but anyway, that you can see the evolution of the surfer. And I think that's, that was so cool. So I think maybe we, that's what we need to do with the encyclopedia. And we can just start piecemealing stuff for ourselves. That'd be kind of cool. <laughs> um, okay. Moving up. Uh, number, three, number three, Rip Curl, rip curl search, search at Barra. Barra. Wow. Search contest. The contest, yes. Case, you know, and Barra, that Barra crazy, cruise. crazy, perfect point break in Mexico. 2006 was the year. It was a watershed year. I was in South America and Peru watching that contest live in the internet cafe of Juan Chaco (laughs) and was in a place near one of the longest laughs in the world and was frothing on this contest. Um, Definitely a huge contest, really popular. I don't think it should be on the list, James. Yeah, I mean, I was, uh, I'm was. i trying to go back really quickly to see what Matt said, why he chose it to, to be on the list. Um, because I didn't watch the... I, I didn't actually watch that episode. Uh, that, episode contest. that contest. That episode of This oh, Is I'm, the ASP. Gosh, I'm so <laughs> locked down for talking about episodes and stuff. I <laughs> no. I mean, it's... I personally, I think it was a, a, a awesome no, contest. I think, yeah, but if you read what Matt said, it wasn't so much that it was the contest itself, although it was pretty awesome. He says that since then, the best thing of it, quite often in surfing right now, as far as content goes, is watching a live stream surf competition. Um, you know, what he said he really loved to do is to actually mute the screen. No, you know, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm, no, 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 no slight to Joe Tapel and Peter Mel and all those. They weren't. They races. weren't. Uh, by the way, they were not the the MCs or the. That's the, true. Yeah, back then. you had a much looser time, yeah. looser format back then. No, uh, no, I remember. no. They, they, yeah, I mean the guys today are, are really knowledgeable and, and really good. But what he said, what he loves to do is to mute the screen and then open up another window and watch all the commentary, the live commentary of people <laughs> watching it. And see, you know, the feedback on that wave and all this stuff. He said, that's really, really fascinating. And it is also like what he's written before, not in this particular joint, but what he's written about watching live stream surf competitions is that it's actually kind of the purest type of surf video content you can watch um, because it's spontaneous. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, it's not edited so that you get, you know, all the best waves. If you watch a heat, you might see someone not get a wave and then the last second get a wave and it's, it's or get attacked really by funny. a shark. Right. I mean, gosh, <laughs> I didn't watch. I watched Mick, Fan- live. Mick Fanning's heat live. You saw it live. I saw yeah. it on, I watched it on tape trying to imagine what it was like to watch live. What were you thinking when you saw that? I was like, Oh, that was, Oh, oh shit, he's getting attacked by a shark. <laughs> oh my god. And then the you know, everything happened really quickly and you hear Joe Turpel being like, Oh, got something going on out there and you're like, Motherfucker, guy just got hit by a shark and you're calm <laughs> as a cucumber here. <laughs> How are you not freaking out? <laughs> uh, he's he's someone you'd like to have with you in a stressful situation, I think. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I, I mean, what's your thought? Do you, do you, because I mean, you've had so, you've watched more surf videos and films and movies than ever. Do you, do you enjoy watching a live surf contest? Yes, I, I really do. I, I, the, the tension is interesting. You know, I love the tension. I like, I like the tactics. I, I actually enjoy seeing some strategy. I think that's fascinating. Um, the, the, there's a lot of anticipation. There's a lot of hurry up and wait. And I think that I love it. I mean, I, I mean, dude, we fantasize about watching live surfing as kids. You know, we had to stay up till 12 in the morning, uh, to watch hot summer nights just to, you know, and it would always be it's disappointing when you, contest. Yeah. Yeah. And then you'd be like, Oh, it's going to be on. And then you're like, Oh, they're just doing BMX and something else, you know, or fucking, jet ski racing oh that was you had to sit through an hour of jet ski racing to wait for fucking 
you know, one of the contests to go on. So to me, this is like a 